you very Dolman's much. Dolman's got lots you know them. <laughs> Dolman does not, not, that's not the, you wouldn't know them, you wouldn't know them. Well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, slightly different um, approach to, I suppose, the, the parallel um, development and uh, regionality theme. And that's uh, with Dolmond within around the Black Sea coast. So taking you from a sort of Britain and Greece, and I want you to take you more easterly um, to the Russian Caucasus and Georgia and down into uh, southern Bulgaria. Um, so my aims for the session really are to really discuss and unpick what it means to call something a dolmen, um, because the term has been really thrown around uh, a lot, in, especially in British uh, archaeology. Um, and I really want to highlight the presence of dolmens around the Black Sea coast, which a lot of people really aren't that aware of, especially when it comes to, um, well, definitely in Bulgaria and also within the Russian Caucasus and Georgia. Uh, and then to overall just really reconsider the term in light of these uh, dolmens in these regions and to maybe think about a new way to approach them, a new way or new things or new names to call them. Um, because uh, personally, I will argue that I don't think dolmen is necessarily a helpful term. Um, so what is a dolmen? Well, the Oxford English Dictionary defines dolmen as a megalithic tomb with a large flat stone laid on upright ones, found chiefly in Britain and in France. Um, obviously, I'm here to dispute this. Um, this is a what you'd call a cromlech in uh, one of the gardens of uh, a house in Cardiff. Um, I thought it was a nice sort of parallel to someone obviously putting one up. Um, but subsequent use in archaeological parlance has resulted in the term becoming synonymous with the Neolithic in Western Europe, which uh, isn't necessarily correct because with a lot of the dolmens in Eastern Europe, we find that they're either Bronze Age or Iron Age even. So it's again, they're not a ne solely a Neolithic phenomenon. Um, and they're usually associated being a part of, again, a wider megalithic culture. Um, the ones in Western Europe, I know, aren't, the uses for them aren't specifically known. Uh, but in Eastern Europe, they're specifically for uh, inhumations, usually multiple inhumations. Um, and so they're associated much more with being uh, a sort of a, a tomb. Um, and at first, the term dolmen, at least within, I suppose, a sort of English uh, sense, first came in from French for the word for cromlech, um, which meaning sort of stone table. So if we take stone table as sort of what dolmens are sort of meant to look like. Um, so these are some examples of dolmens in Western Europe, uh, specifically around sort of like, like a UK perspective, uh, Cornwall, Rassi, and uh, in Wales. So you can see that they're much more, you know, they're much less tomb-like and much more sort of abstract uh, in a sense for the ones that I'm going to, to, to show you. And they're specifically also not usually in, uh, you cannot really see it well here, but they're not usually in sort of huge mountainous places all the time. Um, and they're usually on sort of flatter plains or, or hills or whatnot. And these are some examples from Western Europe, uh, France and Sardinia and Ireland, well that's more further west, but these two are more, more from continental Europe. Um, so the ones that I'll be showing you are much more like the French example um, and also the one from Sardinia, which is quite interesting also to keep in mind. And again, this sort of table appearance with sort of stones keeping on upright ones is, uh, is, is reappearing. So we can at least say that maybe these ones are in fact dolmens, but whether or not there are tombs or not, I think uh, is still to be found. So this is the area in which dolmens occur around the Black Sea coast. Um, so you have them mostly uh, on the edge, almost also going up to the Crimea. Now I think there are some in the Crimea, but the publication record of those is um, slightly more sketchy. Um, and then there are ones uh, also on the Black Sea coast in Bulgaria from Borgas. Um, that also go down uh, into Greece. Now, there are also dolmens in Greece and Turkey, um, but again, I think the, uh, in Turkey, especially the publication record there is even more sketchy um, for some of them. So, uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'll just be talking about the ones which are published really well, and that's in Russia and in also uh, Bulgaria. So, to start with the uh, dolmen in the Russian Caucasus, here is a closer view. Um, so, Actually, there is 
uh, if you see it, you can see, but this, this is a line for Georgia, so there are some in Georgia, and they almost go right across the way to um, Chechnya, um, but are mainly the ones I'll be giving you examples of are up in the Jesus pointer. There we go. Are um, up here in the, in this region here. Um, so dolmens within Russian archaeology are usually to, thought to be part of um, a sort of strange cultural uh, group. So they come after a culture called the Novosvodnaya culture, and they are thought to um, have a sort of slight crossover with what's also called the Maikop culture. Um, now, Russian archaeology is sort of strange in a way because they use both really quite advanced um, scientific dating methods, but also uh, a tendency to refer to coffee as cultures, which doesn't really help at the same time. So the dolmens do have a crossover with my cup, but, uh, culture, but the Russian um, current consensus over what dolmens actually were and who were making dolmens is slightly um, still unsure, but a lot of people still think that they were, there's more of a connection with the Maikop culture, although there's now more of a prevailing theme that they're part of their own individual culture, but these terms don't really help overall, really. And this is just a really fantastic um, sort of uh, cultural historical uh, view of where the dolmens actually come in Russian archaeology. Um, so dolmen culture comes after, I should have sharpened this, but here is Nova Sobodnaya culture, and this is Dolmen culture. Uh, and the dates that they've sort of been aligned to within a culture historic sense end uh, about 1,000, 1, uh, 1,200 to 1,100 uh, BC. So um, in sort of uh, Bulgarian terms and sort of closer to Western Europe terms, this is the end or the, from the beginning of the Bronze Age right the way through to the end of the Bronze Age, beginning of the early Iron Age. Um, so what can, we, what can I say about the uh, past research in Russian dolmens? Well, a lot of them were actually found to contain pigment of red ochre uh, used on the frontal facades and within the actual dolmens, which have been um, tested uh, to have come um, from local, locally uh, around the areas where they've been constructed. They're usually built much more monumentally, so they're less actually uh, the, the table look about them that they had more in Western Europe. Um, there has been radiocarbon dates uh, taken from within some of the um, dolmens which do date them to around, actually confirm it to where they said in a cultural historical manner that they go from being early Bronze Age to uh, early Iron Age. Um, they're usually associated with the fringes, of, as I said, with the late Maikop to Nova Slobodnaya cultures. Um, like Bulgaria, Russian dolmens are mostly what you'd call camera dolmens, and that's one that contain uh, chambers. Um, and similar to Bulgarian dolmens, they are found, mostly found actually in the mountains. And this is very interesting because you, uh, especially in Bulgaria, you don't really have dolmens that are found in lowland areas, they're always found uh, in the mountainous areas, and that's exactly the same as what's happening uh, in Russia. They're being built in specifically mountainous areas. Russian dolmens are not just found actually in the Black Sea coast, like I said, they're also found in uh, the Ural Mountain uh, region as well, but they're much more abstract, these dolmens, and they look a lot more like the ones that you'd find in Western Europe. They're much bigger and they contain three stones and a huge big uh, table uh, top stone. Um, as I said, radiocarbon dated and the pigment has been used from the source locally that have been used within the dolmens. Um, so dolmens in Russian archaeology, actually the term has been used since 1898. Um, uh, by Veselovsky, who excavated uh, the dolmen at uh, Stary Tsarkskoy. And uh, these are some of the finds that they found actually within this part uh, of the um, dolmen. If I go to the next picture, this is a bigger one. So this is actually quite a nice picture of where he, he drew, where he, very simple, nice, sort of everything very square and looking like a little house. Um, and this is where he found some of the uh, the pottery and some jewellery, and this is where they found some burnt grain remains. And this is, I think you read cursive, uh, 19th century Cyrillic, but that says dolmen, uh, which is very important for this because that's a very early use for dolmen in Russia. And since then we know that the term only really came into the Oxford English Dictionary um, at around 1850, we can see that decades later this term was being used in Tsarist Russia, um, which is uh, very interesting actually. So to hit off with the first dolmen from Janier, which is uh, um, which was at the t 
top, so that's around this area here. There we go. Um, this, as you can see, has much more of a beehive appearance, and it's not so much like the ones you were seeing in Western Europe. Um, also, quite strangely, this only contains one chamber, where, as usually a lot of the other dolmens contain many chambers, uh, some of the other ones in Russia and Bulgaria as well. But this has much more of a circular uh, appearance uh, and a whole, I mean, it doesn't really have a scale, but there's a nice cat there, which you can see for sort of size comparison. Um, and so, again, it's kind of composite of many different parts to make a big sort of uh, tomb, whereas the ones in Western Europe were completely different. Uh, this is again Jeannier, you can see the one that I showed you previously over here. Um, these ones have a huge monumental facade and the, this was actually covered by a large mound as well, um, leaving the front uh, section open. Um, and also you can see it's been decorated uh, on the sides um, with uh, engravings and on the inside of the dolmen itself uh, as well. And this is sort of like a reconstruction, which isn't really correct because it would have probably also been covered by a mound, but the artist has left that out. This is another one in the same sort of nearby location at Jubka, um, and uh, this again was a huge dolmen. I don't know if you can see it, but there is a portrait of a man standing there, and that's an actual size comparison of how large the dolmen actually is. So these dolmens are massive and much more like what we would call here um, uh, sort of large monumental uh, tombs and not actually uh, dolmens, but this uh, is called a dolmen within the Russian archaeological literature. And these again were usually covered by a, a mound and had an entrance hole uh, at the front and consisted sometimes of more than one um, chamber. Again, the Jubga dolmen, and what's really interesting about this as well is that so this is the front chamber, this is the back chamber where there are multiple inhumations found. Um, and uh, basically this says that there were also some um, carvings on the wall that were done in carving and also painted over in ochre. <laughs> there was a man here, um, another figure here, and, a, and some sort of animal uh, and the man petroglyph uh, over there as well. And here are some pictures of that. Uh, so there would be two individual uh, men, I don't know what they're doing, they'd be fighting, and then there's the uh, animals over there. And this is again something from Pisanko, uh, Pis Pisnako, which is again a uh, huge big uh, mound with a chamber and also a hole at the front to go in. Uh, this is it again. So how does this really compare with dominant in Bulgaria? Well, as we've seen, the ones in Bulgaria come here in Bulgas, <coughs> in the uh, Suhavan Rodopi region, in the Strandja, and also in the Sakhar mountain region, the Strandja and the Sakhar mountain region. Uh, as well, so mainly in mountains, they're not on the flat ground really. Um, and there again, so they range from one to three chambers. Um, they have many chambers. Uh, some have earth mounds covering the stones, which also produce large amounts of finds, attested to. Also, funnily enough, in Herodotus, who uh, discusses that the Thracians had a big feasting ceremony over when they created mounds for uh, burials. Um, and that there would be games and things and things left outside uh, these mounds and also put inside of them. So this is actually also attested to. Dated to around the early Iron Age, based on chronology and small finds, but sound of the dolmen range in size, all large enough to fit at least an arm and a shoulder through the front opening. I put to reach inside, I don't know if that was what, what the aim was, but they're certainly large enough to do it. Um, spread across the south of the country, there are no, different, there are no radiocarbon dates at all from them in Bulgaria. And I say, yeah, in sort of some vain hope that maybe this will be changed in the future, but as of now there is really no definite dating for them, it's all done on finds. If remains are found within them, they usually consist of multiple inhumations, um, and some are actually deliberately left open and uh, shut, so that's an interesting thing to think about. This is one at Zibernovo, where you have multiple inhumations here, as you can see many different skulls. And this is the only one, uh, the publication I could find where they actually drew bones here. Um, and this shading uh, indicates um, finds fragments of pottery uh, around and outside the mound. And uh, again, there are some bones left here. Pretty bad state of repair in reality, though. This is one at Golian Dervent, which is uh, like the ones actually in Russia, which have slight in relief um, uh, into the front of the dolmen. Um, which is interesting because that isn't found anywhere else actually other than this one. Um, here is one, it's a Karzi, which 
again, sort of monumental facade, sort of like the one at Jeanne, um, and this one was also left open deliberately. Um, so we, but then again, we don't really know if what's found within them was because it was put there or because it was ransacked or taken or put back in at a later date. So this is also still a very hotly uh, disputed topic. Again, Plevun, this one was massive and covered by a mound. There was uh, more of a monumental facade over here, um, and this one had many huge big chambers. The, it's not really published properly at all, um, but the remains were found in this chamber at the back, and the goods were found, small finds were found here at the front chamber. At Belovren, we have a sort of similar case, a huge big stone mound, like in, you see in Russia as well, multiple chambers and actually multiple dolmens within one large mound. And this is again Belovren, where you can see some of the finds, some fibula um, uh, and pins and um, anthropomorphic figurines and pottery uh, in the front part and drinking vessels. So are these dolmens? Uh, well, tomb with a large flat stone laden upright one. So you, we can say that maybe not. In reference to the definition, some of these are definitely not dolmens. We can uh, say by definition. Perhaps the definition should then be scrapped considering these monuments with the same name could possibly have been used and made from a number of different reasons over a huge expanse of space and time because they start at the, obviously the beginning of the Bronze Age and the end in Bulgaria uh, at the sort of right the way through the Iron Age at the end of the Iron Age. So are they all used for the same thing? Did they have the same meaning? Why are they used? Should we just call them megaliths? And are dolmens in Russia and Bulgaria any less dolmen than the dolmens we find in Western Europe? So I think that's what I wanted to leave as a sort of existential question to you all after the talk. So uh, thank you very much and thanks for listening.